Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage Dr. Julio Frank and our esteemed panel. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to again welcome, welcome you all to this Concordia America Summit. Uh, we have a, a panel for the next few minutes that couldn't be more timely. As the world is approaching the end of the pandemic phase of COVID, not the end of COVID, but of the pandemic phase, and we still have a lot of challenges, we need to start looking into the future and learning the lessons for recovery and resilience. And that's the topic of this panel. And we couldn't have better uh, presenters or panelists. We're, we, we're very honored, first of all, to welcome Laura Chinchilla, former president of Costa Rica from 2010 and to 2014. And I would add the first woman president of Costa Rica, uh, having been previously vice president, congresswoman, uh, minister of security, uh, and currently serves as the vice president for World Leadership Alliance at the Club de Madrid. We are also very honored to have Ambassador Mark Green, who is the president and CEO of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, um, a, uh, one of the most prestigious and highly regarded think tanks in, in, in the world on international affairs. He was formerly the administrator of the US Agency for International Development. He's been the executive director of the McCain Institute, and he served also as US ambassador to Tanzania, as well as four terms in the US House of Representatives, Representatives representing Wisconsin's eighth district. So let's, <clears throat> let's dive in right with the uh, first uh, sort of framing question to each of you. Um, you know, the World Health Organization estimates that about 15 million people, as measured by excess mortality, have indirectly lost their lives, directly or indirectly lost their lives to COVID, to the pandemic. Um, so it's clear that we need to learn the lessons. We owe it to so many who have suffered so much and who continue to suffer from this pandemic. So my opening question to both of you is what have been some of the key takeaways from the COVID-19 pandemic? And how can uh, comparisons between different countries, the responses at different stages of the pandemic and comparing national responses, how can that offer insights in dealing with similar crises in the future? Let me start with you, President Chichilla. Well, thank you very much. It is a pleasure and an honor to be in this panel. Uh, I will say that probably the most important takeaway um, is that preparedness is central to any country, to every country, uh, in order to have an adequate response to the crisis. And unfortunately, uh, when it comes to the situation in Latin America, we have to recognize that with some few exceptions, the countries, the nations were not prepared uh, to face that crisis. And in fact, when we see all the figures, not only in terms of the sanitary consequences, but also the economic and social consequences, Latin America was the hardest hit region in the world, among the emerging economies, at least. Uh, so preparedness is important. And in, 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 in that sense, we, we, we have also to remind ourselves that before the pandemic, by the end of 2019, all the conditions in Latin America were very weak. Uh, the region was growing at almost 0% the GDP, uh, and also we were having uh, increasing levels of poverty, inequality, uh, informal, informality in the labor market, and the health systems were very badly funded and very badly uh, administered. Um, and the second takeaway, very, very fast, is that international cooperation it's quite important to face this, this kind of global changes. And also, in Latin America, we are right now, and we were to the, during the last years, in probably the lowest level in terms of intra-regional dialogue and cooperation. Thank you very much. Ambassador Green, what, what are your main takeaways from this very uh, well, painful experience? First, I agree with everything that uh, former President Chinchilla has said. 
maybe a couple of further thoughts. I think a takeaway is the interdependence of countries, particularly in the Americas. What happens in one part of the Americas will inevitably affect all of the Americas. And so as we see vaccination rates in a place like Haiti down in the single digits, that's a problem for all of us. Mm -hmm. Obviously, first and foremost for Haitians, but for all of us, because until we have full vaccination in every part of the world, we're always going to be at risk. I think secondly, uh, we have hopefully learned of the importance of investing in systems. We did see this all coming, right? We uh, knew when the vaccines were being developed the investments that we need to make and we failed. It's not enough to have uh, the medical miracle of a vaccine. You actually have to get it into people's arms. And investing in uh, frontline healthcare workers and healthcare facilities in distribution systems that's something that we simply did not do very well. And shame on us if we don't make those investments now looking forward, because whether it be a new resurgence of a variant of COVID-19 or another disease, we will need to face these challenges again. And again, it's in, in front of us. I think another uh, key takeaway that people don't talk about enough in this context is the importance of governance and government responsiveness. Uh, you know, I, in my days at USAID, I helped to lead the fight against Ebola in DRC. And I always point, to, uh, point out to people that we saw deaths and infections go up after we had a vaccine and after we had interventions. Why? Because nobody trusted the government. And so when the government came out and said, guess what, we've got vaccines, everybody said, yeah, we don't believe you. So investing in responsive governance and uh, democratic leaders who know how to talk in plain terms about the challenges and how you avoid them is crucial. You, you cannot simply focus on medical interventions if you hope to take on public health ch uh, challenges. You have to invest in responsive governance, in communication systems that people can trust. If you don't do that, you will inevitably fall short. Thank you. Those are both uh, of your answers provide, I think, very critical insights into what we need to do better the next time around. Uh, President Chichia, um, I had the honor of serving with you in, in the Inter-American Inter Dialogue when they constituted a, a, a health task force, which uh, produced a white paper on deepening cooperation and, and coordination on health policy in the Americas. Now, as you said yourself a moment ago, one of the, both of you said, one of the big lessons is from this pandemic is, of course, the reality of interdependence and the need for multilateral collaboration as the only way, as opposed to, to nationalist retrenchment, which sometimes this kind of crisis trigger. As opposed to that, what we actually need is more multilateral cooperation. So as a former head of state, very focused on your national responsibilities, but how do you um, experience, what is your experience with actually fostering multilateral cooperation to deal with our domestic agendas, understanding that one reality is not separate from the other. <coughs> uh, yes, well, uh, th that is very critical. As I already said, unfortunately, uh, this crisis arrives at a time when uh, we are having many troubles in our hemisphere uh, for bringing the governments together uh, to articulate a collective response. Let me just give you an example. When we were at the worst moment in terms of the deaths um, uh, as a result of the, uh, of the pandemic, when Latin America, uh, as an average, uh, were suffering about 30% of, uh, of, of deaths, uh, I mean, as, as, you know, as, as, uh, as the percentage of total deaths of COVID, at that time, we were only receiving 7% of the vaccines from the COVAX mechanism. And that is because we were not able to speak with one voice. We had three important economies as part of the G20, and they were incapable of you know, bringing a unique position to the group in favor of the region. So we, we, we didn't see any kind of collective action. 
So uh, it is going to be very hard uh, for uh, those countries, emerging economies, to face the multiple crises that we are facing because most of them are of a global uh, nature. Uh, climate change is another example. So um, in that sense, I think that uh, we will need to, for example, try to encourage the strengthening of the uh, Pan American Health Organization for future situations like this. Secondly, I also think that we will need to mobilize the regional and multilateral cooperation around uh, strengthening the health system, social protection mechanisms. A and finally, we should try to also speak with one voice at the uh, World Health Organization now that we are discussing a new treaty on pandemics. I am part of a initiative and you at the uh, University of Miami are playing a very important role in that sense uh, because we are calling for a new treaty uh, legally Biden so we can be able to demand from the nations uh, enough transparency uh, when we have these situations concerning pandemics. So basically I will say that those are the, some of the activities we should encourage ahead in terms of improving the regional and global responses to, to these situations. That's very good. It actually extends Ambassador Green's pro uh, 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 theme of national governance to the global level. We also need better global governance to deal with yeah. shared crisis. We, we need uh, better dialogue at the highest levels. So beyond health officials who talk fairly regularly, we need to have dialogues that are continuous and continual among heads of state and heads of government so they can talk about challenges. Again, you know, we all saw in the early days of vaccine development some of these challenges coming and yet failed to act accordingly. About a year and a half ago, the Tony Blair Institute uh, put together a report. We were involved, I helped to write a, a small portion of it and what we needed to do looking ahead. And one of them was to make sure that we vaccinated vulnerable populations, particularly healthcare workers throughout the region before we looked at the mass distribution of vaccines across the nation. Why? Because it would hold down the spread and give us more time to work with. So enlightened self-interest, which can only be taken up at the highest levels, I think we need to do a better job. Secondly, I'm, I'm a little more skeptical on the effectiveness of a new treaty only because actually most of these nations are already supposed to report these things and choose not to. And uh, what I think we should do is do what we do on the food security side. So there is a food, um, uh, a famine early warning system called FuseNet developed by USAID but spun off separately governed, which looks at all the indicators worldwide and begins to set up warning signs on vulnerability in food security and helps us to direct resources accordingly. We need to have something on the pandemic side, on the epidemic side, where we have a separate entity, not in any one place, but begin to do the continuous monitoring. Also looking at things like weaknesses in healthcare distribution systems and weaknesses in the front line on healthcare workers. Because all of these signs are, are evidence of weakness that we can't suddenly come to when the epidemic's underway. By that point, it's far too late. So we know what to do. It's a matter of governance, it's a matter of political will, and it's a matter of people setting aside politics and sitting down and talking about the challenges. We may end up having leaders who disagree with each other on 90% of broad issues. This is self-interest, because if we don't have our leaders talk to each other about what's taking place in the neighborhood, we're always vulnerable ourselves. It's in our interest to have those effective dialogues. Yes, I'm, I'm glad that both of you are making that case, because sometimes we create this false dichotomy between action at the global level and at the national level. Yeah. And the truth is everything is global, it's both global and local at the same time, right. and you cannot be effective as a national leader if you're not engaged globally. Um, to me, one of the challenges has been the issue that even though we have international health regulations, <coughs> the enforcement 
uh, and the sort of the, the creation of a system of positive and negative incentives for countries to report on a timely basis outbreaks that put everyone at risk. That's one of the weak links that hopefully in the sort of work uh, that's being followed up will, will be corrected um, because you know, countries have strong disincentives to reporting, fearing right. trade and other right. uh, economic sanctions. And yet when they fail to do that, the backlash, as we have seen with the economic crisis, has, is, is, right. is huge. Let me, um, I, we, we could spend a lot of time talking about this. Uh, it's one, probably one of the most consequential discussions we can have along with, with climate change and geopolitical issues and the war in Ukraine, et cetera. But let, let, uh, we have limited time. So let me just um, bring one last topic that I think is very important. Uh, you, you pointed at the beginning, President Chinchi, how <coughs> COVID-19 also revealed pre-existing issues and magnified pre-existing issues, economic inequality, gender disparities, women having borne disproportionate amounts of the, of the burden, um, government distrust that you, you mentioned very clearly, Ambassador Green. What steps can policymakers, and here I would also like to bring, in addition to policymakers, business leaders and civil society leaders, what can they do to not just prepare us better for the next pandemic, but address some of those underlying structural weaknesses that the pandemic brought to light so dramatically? President yes, well, Chichia. exactly. I, 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 say, I will say that it is a mistake, and we are hearing that from some leaders, uh, to blame uh, the pandemic for the problems that the region is facing. Uh, once again, when we look at what was happening in our region uh, just before the pandemic hit us. Uh, everything was, you know, certainly uh, it had a very negative perspectives in terms of economic growth, uh, social indicators, etc. So uh, what we should be doing now is not only trying to put in place strategies for a fast and inclusive and a sustainable recovery, but most importantly, to try to tackle those structural uh, uh, challenges uh, for good. And uh, basically, I will mention three or four of them. One is has to do with uh, a more kind of sustained uh, economic growth based in more innovation, more competitive. Um, and that also means to invest most in human capital. Secondly, uh, try to tackle the uh, historical gaps that we have in terms of gender inequality and income inequality. Digital inequality is another big challenge. Third, uh, the sustainability uh, challenge. That is uh, something really major. In that sense, we have many opportunities because Latin America have very strong uh, markets for renewable energies. And finally, uh, the issue of, uh, of governance, uh, the quality of the institutions uh, is one of our main challenges too. A very interesting and challenging agenda. Ambassador Green. Sure, I uh, agree with everything uh, that we've just heard. Perhaps on top of that, I'd like to point to what I think is a, a significant challenge that we're facing these days. Uh, we have to be very careful that in our rightful humanitarian response to the fires that are burning, and that is the moral thing to do, that we don't lose sight of the long-term investments that we need to make. So yes, we need to mobilize vaccines. Yes, we need to mobilize food assistance, emergency shelter, emergency water. But that's not a substitute for the long-term development investments that we need to make to help build the capacity. My view is that the goal of, of our foreign assistance should always be to help countries build the capacity to take things on themselves because they want to. So if we find ourselves only thinking about emergency responsiveness and mobilization, I feel like we're falling short and then we're gonna find ourselves a few years from now vulnerable again. Yes, do the obvious. But don't forget about those long-term investments, human capital investments in particular, which at the end of the day will really make all the difference. Yes. Well, <clears throat> the time is short. We, we have uh, a lot of um, sessions still in this fascinating uh, summit uh, with Concordia. 
Uh, but I want to thank our, our two panelists, um, former President Laura Chinchilla and, and Ambassador Mark Green, uh, for a very insightful set of uh, ideas about what comes next. I think the, the world is at a juncture, and uh, depending on the decisions we make now, we may either be facing a, another crisis and the long-term structural problems, or we may actually take the lessons of the pandemic to build not a new, but a better normal towards the future. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking Thank our you. panelists. Thank you.